Good morning. morning. We'd like to welcome you all on this 13th Sunday of Pentecost. A special welcome to anyone worshiping with us for the first time here in person and also online. Reverend Hughes is on vacation, but we'll be back in the office this week. Thank you to Daniela, serving as our tech person, and to Karen as our liturgist. We also thank Simon Tisdale and his dad, Ed, who will be hosting the Lemonade and Fellowship following the service. The altar flowers are given in loving memory of Joanne Peretti on her birthday today from her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Also on the altar are flowers from John Wilklansky's funeral service this past week. The cupola is lit in loving memory of Fred Kirby Bauer by the Bauer family. We will continue our summer tradition here at the UCC where the congregation chooses the last hymn. You can give your hymn selections to the ushers during the offering and our music director, Horatio Castro, will choose one of, one of them for us to sing. Uh, mark your calendars for a few exciting events coming back as we get back into the full swing of things for the fall. We will be bringing back from many years ago, before even my time, with the Welcome Back Carnival on September 18th, following the church service. We hope you all can join us, and if you are interested in volunteering, please let us know. I know there will be a dunk tank, and I will not be in it, but I believe Reverend Hughes will be. So, it's definitely a good time to come. The day before that, we will again be participating in the Historical Society Apple Festival. We participated last year, and it was a lot of fun. Our popcorn machine was a big hit, and we will be doing that again. If you are able to help with that, please let me know. And I know Karen has an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. So many of you know me as the chair of the care ministry. And as chair, we often, um, one of the functions of chair is, and the ministry, is to host collations or gatherings for families after funerals. And we have uh, a collation coming up on September 10th. Uh, which is a Saturday for Janet Neal. And some of you may remember Janet. She was a longtime member of the church, moved to Florida several years ago, um, and she's recently passed away. Her granddaughter is Rachel Wood, who is a more recent member, so many of you may know Rachel. Um, I, unfortunately, uh, am going to be away that week and that weekend, so I'm going to be looking for volunteers to help with the collation, um, provide baked goods, and uh, perhaps even take a little bit of a leadership role. So I'll be putting a sign-up genius sheet in the Hilltop News this coming week and the following week. And if you have any interest at all in helping out, please let me know. I'll try to do as much as I can before I go. Um, but many of you uh, are really well versed in doing this, so I'm hoping uh, to get volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other announcements? If not, then let us prepare to worship together as we open our hearts to God's love and grace. Please join me in the call to worship. We gather together full of God's love for us. Because 
Sometimes easier said than done, we seek God's guidance. Knowing that because we have a God of love and grace, in whose image we were created, we are called, we are equipped, and we are able. We unite with one another to grow in our faith in God and celebrate the steadfast love that endures now and forever. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Eternal and loving God, who created us in your image, you are a God of love and a grace greater than we could ever imagine. We come to you now in a spirit of love and gratitude with a hope of transformation that your grace may fill our hearts so that we may be more loving and more kind. Give us the strength and the wisdom so that we may be your hands and your feet here on earth. This we ask in the name of the risen Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. seated. We come now with love and gratitude for all that God has given us as we bring our tithes and offerings to the altar.
please join me in the, care, the prayer of dedication. God of endless love and grace, we give you thanks for your eternal presence and constant guidance. We bring to you now our tithes and offerings as we stand before you with humble hearts and with gratitude for your life-changing love. May these gifts we bring to your altar now allow your love and your grace to flow through the world for all to see. This we ask as disciples of the risen Christ who asks us to follow him. Amen. So many of you know, this is always the part of the service where both Reverend Hughes and I get really nervous because there's something in this box that we have to talk about and we don't know what it is. So if you haven't seen it before, the mystery box is when some of our young people bring in an item and then we have to talk about it. It could be anything except a living animal, that's one rule we've given, no living things in the box. So I believe Thomas and Anna brought it in today. A little nervous. Ah. So there's Lego and a Rubik's Cube. I actually know what these are, which is good. That's helpful. I'd like to invite all of the children who would like to, or any young at heart, if you feel so inclined, to come join me. of you like Lego? Young at heart can answer too, even if you're not sitting here. How many people like Lego? That's what I thought. Lots of people like Lego. How about the Rubik's Cube? Not as, still some, but not as many hands. You have one? I do too. You know, my brother took a class, a math class in college for credit. I mean, he, that was the one he was required to take in accounting. And it was called Puzzles, Games, and Algorithms. And his final test was to finish the Rubik's Cube in a certain amount of time. So he could do it pretty quickly. Me? Nope. No idea. Tried. I just get frustrated. I cannot do it. But Lego, I find fun and relaxing. I like when there's directions and things you have to follow, and then you get to build some big structure. Savannah's shaking her head. I think she likes better when she can create her own thing, which is kind of cool about Lego, right? What about you, Abby? And I like Rubik's Cube. And when I first got it, I, like, I messed with it. But then one day I like spin it around and it looked like that. It took me two weeks to like hold on and stop. It took you two weeks to just get one side, one color. Yeah, it's hard, right? Who here knows how to actually do the Rubik's Cube and get all the sides different colors? Nobody? All right. Well, maybe I'll have to have my brother come in and show us. But what these make me think of is that some things are fun and easy, and some things are really hard. And when things are hard, I bet you can guess where I'm going to tell you to turn. Who do we turn to when things are hard? God. Right? So with Lego, I just kind of do it myself. Maybe I follow directions. Maybe I change a few things. With the Rubik's Cube, honestly, I get so frustrated with the Rubik's Cube that I probably would pray and ask for help. But even when other things in life are hard, like maybe our parents tell us to th do things that we don't want to do, or maybe we play a sport and we're really struggling, we really practice and we just can't get something right, we can't get the ball in the goal, or we can't get the cartwheel right, whatever it is, some things are just hard. 
And if we turn to God and pray to God and ask for help, it can help us calm ourselves. It's called centering. We center ourselves. We connect with God. And I think if we do it enough, it will bring us some more patience and some more perseverance. And if it's something that doesn't really um, matter too much in your life, like a Rubik's Cube, it's okay to stay with God and leave the Rubik's Cube aside. Sound good? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for games and puzzles, for things that are fun and easy and things that are challenging. Thank you for always being with us through the easy times and the difficult ones. We give thanks that we can count on your presence every day and in every way. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I invite you to join me in our responsive call to prayer. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Let us enter to ne- together now into a moment of silence. Amen. Are there concerns, are there celebrations that you would like to lift up to God today? Tom? Um, This past week we learned of the sudden passing of our former custodian, Mike Bell, and we'd like to offer Yes, Mike Bell was a former custodian of ours. We lift up his family. He passed away this past week from an aggressive form of melanoma. We pray for his peace and for healing for his family. Lord, in your goodness, 
We remember Janet Neal, grandmother of Rachel Wood, who passed away recently. Janet was a member of our church family and has resided in Florida in recent years, as you heard during the announcement. We surround all of Janet's family with our love, and we ask for God's grace as they say their sacred goodbyes. God, in your goodness. We continue to pray with Ellen Wachlansky and the entire Wachlansky family on the death of Ellen's husband, John. We lift up all of them and surround them all with our love. Lord, in your goodness. We lift up Peter Harmeling, who lost his brother earlier this month. Peter is also recovering from a broken hip after a bike accident. So we pray for Peter's healing and comfort. Lord, in your goodness. We pray for Samantha, Laura Kaplan's daughter. Samantha is recovering from COVID, and her daughter, Laurel, who is five months old, cannot be vaccinated. We ask for healing for Samantha and for strength for the entire family as they continue to navigate COVID. Lord, in your goodness. We continue to pray with those listed in the Hilltop News and lift up each of their families as they continue to navigate each of their individual situations. Lord, in your goodness. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we give thanks for this time to gather together in your presence and in your love. We give you thanks for the blessings that have come and the blessings that are yet to come. As we continue with our journey, help us remember that you are always with us for whatever may happen. Rest your spirit upon us so that we may shine your light into the world as instruments of peace and ambassadors of your love. As we have shared with you the prayers of our hearts and the prayers that we've spoken, we know that you are a God who is always with us, and for that we give thanks. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, the scripture reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses, uh, verse 1 and verses 7 through 14. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Now, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you are repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the oppressed and the disabled, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Here ends the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let 
us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts upon the scripture be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Imagine with me, if you will, you are invited to a dinner party. You get there and you see the table, this glorious table full of the most delicious, most beautiful food you've ever seen. The dishes are overflowing and you're not sure that there's space on the table for each guest's plate. Where do you sit? Do you take a seat at the head of the table? Do you sit along the side? Maybe you look for somebody you know or somebody you want to know. Do you notice if anybody is sitting alone and maybe could use a friend? Now let's change it a little bit. You're the host of this glorious dinner table, a feast fit for a king, as they say. Who do you invite? Is it family and friends? Is it the boss you want to impress? Or the neighbor with the swimming pool? Because this has been a crazy hot summer and you are hoping for an invitation. In today's scripture, Jesus gives us some advice on who to invite, where to sit, and how to interact. Hosting such a dinner often includes friendliness, graciousness, but in today's story, it seems like that may have been lacking. Jesus watches as a man with dropsy, which I had to look up. I didn't know what that was. It is extreme swelling, usually related to heart or liver problems. So this man with dropsy shows up to this dinner, and he watches as the party guests ignore the man. They do nothing to help him or acknowledge him. Jesus heals the man and sends him on his way, and when he asks the guests, why didn't you help him, they have no response. Jesus even asks them, if he was family, would you have helped? Still, they have no response. Jesus then watched as the guests chose their seats, and he cautioned them, do not be so full of yourself that you sit in the most distinguished seats, because if somebody of more importance comes, you will have the embarrassment of having to move. Instead, sit in the most lowly seat, and then you may have the honor of being invited by the host to a more prominent seat. And then Jesus tells the guests who they should invite. He tells them rather than inviting friends and family and rich neighbors, because those people will most likely repay you with a gift or an invitation to their home for another scrumptious meal. Instead, you should be inviting the poor, the oppressed, and the disabled, the people that are unlikely to repay you. Because with this, this is how you receive eternal salvation. Today's scripture takes place at a table. But what do the readings tell us about life in general? Instead of looking at the dinner table, let's look at the kingdom of God where God is the host and somehow each of us continues to get an invitation and a place in God's kingdom every day, even though we've done nothing to deserve it and we cannot repay God's love and God's grace. In today's story at the table, Jesus is teaching us about kingdom behavior and about living in our faith both figuratively and literally, about who we invite to the table and how we interact, regardless of ability or their place in society. God is the ultimate host, and we are simply guests in God's kingdom. Jesus is describing what it looks like to have a place in that kingdom and to have kingdom behavior. If we truly want God's rewards, more than the rewards of somebody with a higher social status, then we need to adjust accordingly. So do we live by faith? Take Mallory, Liz, and Sarah. You may remember them as the college softball players that they were several years ago. Sarah worked really, really hard, but she never hit a home run, not in practice, not in a game, not ever. 
She was playing her very last college game, a game that would decide which team went to the NCAA Division II playoffs and which team went home. The score was tied at zero. Sarah got up to bat. The pitcher threw the first ball, and Sarah swung for a strike. The second pitch was thrown. Sarah connected, and the ball sailed over the fence. Sarah began to, ran, began to run and ran past first, first base. She realized this, and she could have just gone back and touched the base. It wasn't a big deal because the ball was gone. Nobody could tag her. But she panicked. She turned too quickly, and she went down. She would later learn that she tore a ligament in her knee. Her team was instructed not to go to her because of some odd softball rule that if they did, the home run would not count. And if they put somebody in to run for her, they would have to stay at first base. They could not continue to run. And she would not have scored all three runs. So while the coaches and the officials were deciding what to do, Sarah, lying by herself in the dirt, Mallory, from the other team, asked if she could help Sarah. There's no rule about helping the opposing team. So Mallory and her teammate Liz went to Sarah, asked her permission, lifted her up, and carried her base to base, making sure that she touched each bag. Sarah's team won the game, and they went to the playoffs. Mallory and Liz's team went home. Mallory and Liz gained nothing from helping Sarah. In fact, they, gained, they risked losing the game, and they risked upsetting their teammates by losing the game. But that didn't matter to them. That what was more important than the game or than their social standing with their friends was that Sarah needed help. I don't know what faith background Mallory and Liz have, but I see the Holy Spirit working in them that day. They were living by faith in something, and they were exhibiting kingdom behavior. Why did they help? Why do people help? Sometimes people help because it makes them feel better about themselves. So they help more to feel better. Sometimes they're trying to get brownie points with God or with their peers. Sometimes they feel a duty to do so. But helping others is not just a box we check and then we move on. The true reason to help is because we are filled with God's love. God gives to us because God loves the world, and it is our job to do the same, to share that love with others, because God is in our hearts. God wants us to share our hearts, and God wants us to serve. The word serve is actually a significant part of our vocabulary. So much so that I'm going to ask you to do something we don't normally do during a sermon. I'm going to ask you all to participate and complete the sentence. Police officers protect and we thank our soldiers for their service. Mail carriers are civil. In church, we sit in the sanctuary for the 10 o'clock. We used to call them waiters and waitresses, but now if you visit a restaurant, your order will be taken by a server. If we want to make a call, on a cell phone, we check how many bars we have to see if we have service. Thank you for your help. When things don't work, we say they're out of service. But one thing that should never be out of service, the church and the people in it. So let's make sure we are never out of service. Get excited and share that excitement with others. Go to your ministry meetings and say, this is my ministry, this is my responsibility, I am not out of service today. Go to coffee hour and say, this is my coffee hour, this is my responsibility, and I am not out of service today. Do your ushering duties and say, this is my sanctuary, this is my responsibility, and this, I am not out of service 
today. We need to serve it like we mean it and serve it like we own it, like it's ours, because it is. And then, when we've committed to serve inside this church, let's commit to making sure we serve outside of these walls, too. After all, for many of us, we actually have more opportunities to serve outside the church than in it. My friend Heidi shared a story recently about how she served outside the church walls. Heidi lives in Missouri, and it was the hottest day of the year, this year, when we know we had some record heat, so it was hot. She drove by a car that was broken down on the side of the road. She thought about stopping, but she figured she didn't know anything about cars, so what good would she be? She also had no idea who was in that car, so she was a little nervous about the safety of herself and of her children. So she went on her way. Two hours later, she drove back by. The car was still there. Remember, hottest day of the year. So she decided to go to a gas station and get a bottle of water. When she came back, she saw that not only was there a woman scared in the car, but also two small children. I don't know the end of that story, but I like to believe that that woman and her children safely returned home that day. But regardless of the outcome, Heidi gained nothing from going to get the water. She took her time, she stepped outside of her comfort zone to help somebody she didn't know. She was living by faith with a heart full of God's love. A heart so full that she was willing to sacrifice for somebody she didn't know. She was exhibiting kingdom behavior. She was not out of service. And something as simple as a water bottle could have saved the lives of those children and their mother that day when they were stuck in a hot car. There is no one right way to serve. God is more interested in why we serve than in how we serve. God wants us serving because of a love of Jesus and a gratitude for everything that God does for us every day. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. We are most like Jesus when we are serving others. Have we been like Jesus lately? Or have we been out of service? It's time to commit to being in service and to serving like we mean it. Amen. So the final hymn chosen by the congregation is God Be With You Till We Meet Again. It is hymn number 672.
people of God, our service of worship has ended. Let us go now from wherever we may be with a heart so full of God's love and grace that we are never out of service. Amen. Thank you.